nacimos acá. 66 años de vida. Lo que debe sentir una persona que esté viendo lo que quiso hacer. No voy a sentir no tarea, tristeza. Bueno, es importante Le que cuando uno listo. pasa un momento como el que yo estoy pasando, ahorita que voy. Claro, sí, ahorita poco. Después, bueno, me da alegría. Llegó la noche fatal. Eso es bueno. Eso es bueno. Llegó la noche fatal. Noche de agonía. ¿Qué opina usted de este proceso de división política? que tenemos entre, como decimos popularmente aquí, chavistas y adecos, producido por la señora Tamara Villamil. Yo le digo a la gente, al entrar a mi cuarto, primero tienen que tocar a Chávez. Y el que no lo quiera no puede entrar, porque ¿por dónde va a entrar sin tocarlo? ¿Ah? Ahorita la sedimentación nos está matando a todos. Ante todo por la plaga, por la rata, por muchos insectos que se van acercando hacia los palafitos. Pero la sedimentación sí nos está afectando muchísimo, porque la gente está emigrando, Congo está quedando solo. Y es algo que nos aterra. Y Congo tiene poco tiempo ya. El tiempo de Congo es muy corto de vida. Porque el pueblo ya está perdido en pocas palabras. Ya esto es Monti Culebra. Hello, everybody. Hello. My name is Patricia Solvaram. I am a journalist based in Los Angeles, California. And I welcome you to the fourth part of the talks about Once Upon a Time in Venezuela, or Erase Una Vez in Venezuela. A wonderful, you could see the beautiful pictures from the trailer already, a beautiful and timely documentary that has been selected by Venezuela to compete in the Academy Awards category of Best International Feature. It has also been the first Venezuelan feature-length documentary to premiere at the Sundance Festival. So that's a big deal. It did so last year. And since then, it has been showcased in top festivals worldwide, including IDFA, Hot Docs, CPH Docs, Doc Aviv, picking up 13 awards so far, including the best international feature at Hot Springs Documentary Film Festival. This film tells the story of the Venezuelan village of Congo Mirador, that used to be prosperous, alive with fishermen and poets, and now it is decaying and disintegrating, a small but prophetic reflection of Venezuela itself. As you may know already, Venezuela has been at the center of attention for many years because of its humanitarian and political crisis. But yet this film feels different. It has nuance, it's compelling characters and the succession of events really grab us and by the end provoke a deep reflection into how and why a country fell so low and so badly. This film has received fantastic reviews and among them I would like to quote one from The Hollywood Reporter that said that the film provides an illuminating firsthand account of a country in this sphere. And we're going to be here to talk about the film. We have, um, I'm super honored to be here because not only I'm with two of my Venezuelan um, fellow uh, colleagues, um, but I'm also accompanied by the only man in the chat room. <laughs> so hello. today, hello, Sepp. I'm going to begin by order. So we have the honor to have Gabriela Rodriguez with us, who will be hosting this event. We have a feature to ask questions. So we welcome all of you guys in the audience to send us our questions. We'd be more than happy to answer those for you. And so, well, to tell you more about Gabriela, she's an award-winning film producer from Venezuela. She received an Academy Award nomination for Best Picture for her work in Roma, 
I'm sure that many of you have watched that film, um, mm -hmm. directed by Alfonso Cuaron, and she was the first Latin American woman to hold the nomination in that category. Then we have Annabel Rodriguez, the director of the film, and we have Sepp Bruderman, the producer and editor. Thank you very much. Ask your questions, and I'm going to leave you with Gabriela. Thank you so much, Patricia. Hello, Annabel. Hello, Sepp. Um, Hello. It's an honor to be here with you guys. And um, first of all, let me tell you how much I loved the film. I was moved. Um, I felt it had so much humanity, and uh, I was I was moved beyond uh, as a Venezuelan, but also just as a as a human. You know, it 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 really felt relatable to to in in, in, a, in a massive scale and i'm sorry that i'm not being very eloquent here but but it, it was truly touching there was something about um how you manage to portray every character uh as as real people and i am making an assumption here that um, Annabelle, when you went into this, you, you you came with the prejudice that for all of us Venezuelans who have lived under this terrible regime for over 20 years, we, you, you have sides, you know, you have formed an opinion of who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. And yet you went in and you were able, able to tell this story uh, just showing humanity, showing the tragedy of what's happening to the lives of the, the people of Congo, but also um, it, I felt it really represented something beyond that. I think it was a sample of what's happening across the country uh, in terms of, of the decay of what has happened all over Venezuela to livelihoods, to people, to, to, to even to integrity, humanity in, in, in a very large scale. And then on the other hand, it also uh, made me uh, reflect a lot about sort of populism and and the, the erosion of democracy as, as we were talking before um, and and something very very representative of what seems to be happening in the world today globally I mean I think there's this division that whether it's the new way we consume information or the populism that's that sort of filled every political party and, and government in recent years makes us feel that we have to choose a side and it's good versus bad or right versus left or um and, and and in a way i feel that we we went into that pattern so many more than 20 years ago when this chavism divided us as as a country as people as who we identified to be as venezuelans and made us choose a side and yet in your story you address that so beautifully because it really does represent a lot more than than just that. So I think you tell a very powerful message that can relate globally to to what's happening around the world. Um, I wanted to start by asking uh, a couple of questions. I will start with how do you guys know each other, Sep? How do you come to be part of of this project with Annabelle? Um, and and how do you guys? get on this journey together. So should I start or, or you, Annabelle? Annabelle, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, yeah. We can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. Well, maybe I started. <laughs> well, uh, uh, we, we basically know each other since film school. We studied film in, in London together. And then we didn't see each other for a long time. And then we met years later in New York and, and uh, it becomes very, it's like a soap opera more or less. Like we, we got together and, and made films together. And then basically this, the whole film, during the whole process of this making film, we, we basically got together, had a child and, and got divorced again all through, through the making of, of the film. So, so um, it's not that I came on board or something. It's like I, I, I was there. It came, came from within, and we, we lived in Venezuela together for, for, for many years. And um, so, yeah, it was not that I came on board. It was growing from, from inside. It's a, it's a family film, so to say. I think now, Annabelle, we can hear you. 
<laughs> Before you could not hear me. Okay, I no. see. Yeah, well, better because what I was saying is that we were we were coming with a Venezuelan soap opera here, and it's actually like this. This is and like the film Gabriela. This film is more than a. I mean, it is a film, but it's beyond a film. It's a whole process of life. Of and I would say at this point, uh, it is even a healing process of a moment that have been uh, uh, absolutely painful for for Venezuelans because well as you well know we are coming from a from a progressive devastation that came into actual devastation over the last years and this what means in human terms is well divided fam families people dying uh, massively for even for tuberculosis and things like that and not only people far away from you but even people of the of a lost middle class i mean i could talk so long about it so then it is a pain it's a deep loss and then we became a society of barriers more or less and this means um in that in terms of soul well you know you know what we are talking about so then the film became a process of of uh, of observing what what was going on in us by seeing this reflection on the mirror of Congo Mirador and that's how we treated the story in total empathy with the people um and 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 following the things that were common to our own stories um including uh, we tried as well to include uh, not only the political level but um as well um something that has to do more with the sp a spiritual world uh, that is represented in this um uh, luis guillermo camarillo this old man that plays that is a poet and so on that he this gives a little bit of a, of the flavor of um uh, of a world of grace and of um, poetry that uh, it is somehow they are still existing. And, and the whole thing together, I'm very impressed with your words because actually at this point, having done the whole journey, uh, my questions are going more into that, uh, into that level. Like what can we learn from this process right now in which the world is coming, is becoming crazy in, in this binary way of thinking. Something really has to change in them in our minds to 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 not to lose the agreements, the common, the social agreements, isn't it? And not to disintegrate. But well, this is a whole uh, conversation. <laughs> Yeah, we can talk about this forever. Um, yeah. but going back to the film, um, what made you guys choose to tell this story? I mean, why this story? Annabelle, you're from Caracas, uh, Sepp, you're Austrian, and sort of what motivated you to tell this story about these people? Well, uh, the, the, it was always a, a um, necessity and an impulse to look for stories that would go into the theme of how are we as a society that is being determined by the fact that we are oil extractors and our whole economy and our whole culture was so deeply uh, permeated by that fact. So um, since years ago, I began to go to Congo Mirador looking for that story and to this, and to this area of Lago de Maracaibo in which you have uh, heavily marginalized and abandoned communities really practically next to the, uh, the industrial side of the, of the oil, the oil platforms. And uh, so then this was like a first impulse. And uh, after some years, I came to, to shoot a short in Congo Mirador that was called The Barrel, and it moved from the world of the kids. It was a group of, of uh, brothers and sisters, fishing kids, that, um, well, they organized these races with the, with the boats and so on. And in the okay, I knew that the village was getting lost because of the sedimentation, and people were asking me, could you do something about it? And we would like to tell that, the, that 
that the, that the people knows this to see if the government could pay some attention to us at the end. Is this, you know, longing for some kind of attention, marginalized society, marginalized society. And um, in that point, I thought that I would have liked to, to tell this story, but from the perspective of the most vulnerable, vulnerable, which who are the kids. Huh? And I had already some time working with them. And uh, that's how we came to, to a, co a first concept. We wanted to tell a coming of age story within that environment. And it would have been called uh, Growing Up in Oil. So, and by the way, we did prepare a, a clip that we would like to see that shows you a bit of that world that we wanted to get into and the perspective from which we wanted to, to see it from. Pretolio. ¿Y qué yo? El de no se para. Oh, it's heartbreaking to see that. It's it's really, really. Um, uh, and yeah, sorry, Sepp. No, no. Um, I just uh, wanted to take over because he, because basically that's how it started. No, but this 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 short film that we made that was about the kids' world. But we always had like this instinct or this feeling that there's there's something much much more important and much much deeper and much much profound to tell in this in this village. As we knew it would be sedimenting, we knew there's problems. It, it would probably disappear. They said it would be one or two years. We didn't know it was seven years in the end. But but um, we knew that we could maybe tell the story that represents the story of the whole country in this village because it's so closed off from everywhere else and there are the Chavistas and the non-Chavistas and, and, and it kept, kept growing and growing and growing and Annabelle would always go and come back and I'm the producer, but I'm also the editor. So I would always receive these treasures, you know, to, to like, wow, okay, the story could go there or there or there or there. And it kept growing and growing. And in fact, it still is growing because in the end we had this thing, okay, this is a film about Venezuela. It's not a film about this village, it's about Venezuela. And now, I mean, when you look what's happening in America, what's happening in, in, in so many countries now, this, this corrosive force of populism, it's like in, in the end, we are now at a stage where it's like, this is a movie about our times. And it's really like, almost like a, a cautioning for the whole world. It's like, okay, be careful because if, you're, if you don't care for your democracy, this is where you end up, you know? In, in this destruction, basically. So mm. it, it kept growing and it still keeps growing. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you answered part of what my next question was going to be. Um, oh, but sorry. In, in a general, no, it's great. <laughs> um, but this is a multi part question that I'll let you guys decide sort of how, how you want to tell it. Um, sort of, I, I felt that filmmaking was amazing because you've, you've, you don't feel the camera there. You, you're you able to immerse yourself with the characters and, and be in that journey, you know, discover who they are and, and what they're, and, and hear their stories as if, um, as if, I mean, I felt that as if I was there. So my question was, how long did it take you to make this? Um, how often were you going there? Where did you live? And and in the in the, in the sense, how much, sort of SAP contributed to your process as the director of this from an outside perspective, because regardless of how much that loving marriage that you guys had and how long and, and how often he was living there or being there and, and living through this Venezuelan crisis, I am sure that his perspective was somewhat remo removed, you know, coming from an outside, which I, I am presumed, but you can tell me that it was helpful. Um, and if you guys can talk a little bit about that process, um, for you guys. 
Yes, well, I would go to Congo Mirador during five years where we shooting and uh, uh, the the team, the, the the shooting, the film team, film crew would we would have gone three or four times a year, and every time we would stay in the village two, three weeks, even four weeks, and the whole it takes a bit longer because of the uh, transport times and so on. So um, it worked like this, and at the very beginning, we used to hire uh, one of these palafitos, they are called, um, where it was inhabited by one uh, man, and it was, um, yeah, we used to hire it from him, and he was our friend. We shot, we shot sequences with him, with Tani, and there was a point when he moved this house this house was moved as the as you are gonna the ones that have not seen the film they they have this particular way of of leaving the village because they they have to they are forced to migrate yeah and uh, well he left and we were left without place where to live and that was the occasion in which we could propose to Tamara with whom we did not have contact really because she would uh, identify us with the opposition or esqualidos as we are uh, the opposition people are called in Venezuela which means uh, like the ones with flavor so we were the ones with without flavor and <laughs> and um, so then there was no contact for two three years and when this house was moved we did propose to Tamara could we please stay in, can you host us and we, for, as a service and then we pay you? Basically, we proposed a business and uh, Damara is a business woman and that's how we ended up going there and uh, living there with her uh, during two years in this way that I'm explaining to you. We would travel and live there and it was an extraordinary experience because of course at the very beginning one sees the person a little bit like in the movie that you know you see this you know I am here with Chavez and I'm in this red room and uh, you know and these four the ones that don't adore him so much <laughs> is really a punch in the stomach <laughs> so uh, this relationship began as a punch as a punch in the stomach and evolved into what I would say a friendship you know a, on an understanding a, a, a very very humanly touching understanding. So <clears throat> the way in which it would happen is that Seb, uh, I would come every time with these materials and we would have discussions about the story. I mean, the story was always the main priority of the process. It's like this light to, to drive you through and to understand what is going on with the people in relationship with the main theme, which is that this village is sedimentating as well, together with this theme of what is going on with the, with the political tension and in, in what place is the personal story of this person going no? so in relationship with this, with this um, uh, seems so that's how it was interwaving all the time it was a permanent thing and at the same time raising funds <laughs> you know what i mean sending a hundred applications and yeah. receiving all the rejections there was a point that it was like you know let's just collect this and make an installation <laughs> an, an artist installation because nobody would understand what was our idea? We wanted to make like, you know, this epic, this choral piece with five characters and, you know, the whole country really put there. And, and this was a process of decantation of the whole process. You actually saw, you were commenting to me that you saw one of the cuts. And then, you know, this process, traumatizing process of bringing everything to the bone, it, that took lots of, um, Tears. <laughs> lots of tears. I mean, lots of, I mean, that's always in an editing process, but of course, as we are so close together, like, yeah, lots of fights and, 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 but good fights in the end, because you believe in the same thing. And 
And it shaped the story in a way because um, Annabelle was, especially in the beginning, she was very angry. You know, she had, like she had a lot of anger in herself against this this regime and against everything. And I always thought, like, okay, that we cannot have anger as the principal motivation to make a film because in the end, we are dealing with people here. And and even Tamara represents something that is okay. On the one hand, she represents the Chavists, but she loses. As, it's a bit of a spoiler now, but she loses in the end as well. Which is what happens in in Venezuela that only the top thousand have their bank accounts in Switzerland and all, all everybody is losing, you know. So I, I tried to 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 work this in a way, or we tried then in in these fights and these conversations to to see the humanity in all the characters, and 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 make it more like a film that if you if you see in the future, it could be a film that could heal this country in a way, or could could, could contribute to the healing of this country, and not just making bad, black and white, and you're the bad and we are the good and so on. It doesn't it doesn't it's pointless in a way. You no, know? so mm-hmm. uh, yeah, in the end, it's it's a movie that tries to understand like who we are and why are we doing what are we doing and and uh, yeah, it was a long long painful but also joyful process <laughs> yes, no, it was, and, as a, and as filmmakers as well this um to achieve this um a closeness with people it it, it takes um like an in, in, internal change on how to actually how to be present how to shoot the premise was to shoot with the listening you know literally literally instead of so you know when you're looking you're kind of like in this kind of energy that you're like like penetrating no 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 this was more about letting oneself be penetrated and this sounds maybe this sounds even new age whatever but i think so to me this is a concrete thing and a concrete principle that really was transversal to, to the process and not very obvious or or quickly to do it too time and years and now we have this you know in the way of working so and it was a tremendous school as well to 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 find like a, a method and some sort of principles and as well a language a language as well we still fight though it's fine <laughs> I don't. yeah that's, that's our language you know all all the team knows that yeah. <laughs> for the next film maybe you're married again and then we'll, we'll stay tuned for the soap opera as we say. Um, season season two exactly um i just have one last question and then we're gonna um let patricia um, go to the audience and get their questions um in terms of process of of, and this is more for the filmmakers watching this. It is so difficult in Venezuela and for those who shoot there, and also in countries where the government is so, so entrenched in everyday life. There's not a single uh, uh, business, there's not a single uh, sort of uh, um, industry in the country that can work separated from the government and the government micromanages everything and there's no freedom of expression uh it, it's really hard to get anything across you manage to get access to the governor you manage to get access to 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 a chavista like tamara to speak to you openly about manipulating votes and paying people for the votes you you manage to get access to so many things that uh, uh, we so rarely see in in countries where the dictatorship is so embedded uh, in in everyday life, so how were you able to gain that access, and what were the obstacles in the process that you had to overcome, uh, not only for those Venezuelan filmmakers who who might be trying to accomplish something, but also in the sense to 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 filmmakers everywhere who are watching this that have to all the time kind of find creative ways to be able to to have access to tell their stories. Yeah, well, the first thing is that um, is to be open and not. Uh, I, I the general attitude that I was talking to you about it it, it 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 that is what actually allowed us to to do all that, um, and by that I mean that you know to to be open and a little bit. Um, 
you know, calm down, <laughs> to calm down and to have a cer certain impassibility about things in the moment when they are happening. I, I think this was uh, quite crucial. Um, why Tamara allowed us to see uh, how she proceeds, uh, I think, and as a as a citizen, uh, that's actually what I find the most worrying of of what we witness is, and it is um, the naturalization of the corruption in Venezuela. I mean, it, one can discuss about the reasons why this is like that, but it is really intricated in the culture right now. And in Congo, it's particularly obvious. Um, and I think that it, it is actually being shown to us, the filmmakers, as a way of showing, you know, who's the leader, who's the force here. There is the work being done. So, and it's it's worse than 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 to than to know that it's wrong. It's it's just naturalized, and that's why this happened this way. And we got into the governor that is um actually uh he is the guy that. Uh, Together with Chavez, they gave the coup. They made a coup d'état in the year '92, and that's how they came into the political scene with a coup d'état. And he was there, so then he's one of the sacred figures of the of this leadership, this uh, regime. Uh, however, he that he did in that in those years, he did this um, this event that consisted in that the gov governor would receive the people representatives of the of the communities and in each uh, municipality the way in which the their leadership works is that even if there is not a major from your party you still put some representative of the party there to make contact with people uh, so and and to Overall, to spread propaganda, I would say, and to and to be part of a brainwash process. So then, this person he was constantly there in a, in the in the village, and of course, I was attentive to all the process that the, all the relay all that relationship. And when I saw the opportunity that he would bring up this opportunity that the governor would receive them, so then we were moving around that, and it was something like. Um, okay, there is opportunity that the, the governor could receive you. This is a travel that takes two days from Congo Mirador to 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 Maracay. When you have to go in a boat, in mud bikes, in 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 trucks, in you know, and and going through many obstacles. The first one is to find ben, uh, petrol, <laughs> which is like the worst the worst paradox. The place where the oil comes from and is the difficulties to find petrol already in those years so um, they achieve um they achieve that and then we work the production around it so then of course when i arrived to the governor i'm not like you know i'm just like impossible just like going and with a mind and no mind <laughs> this i say to my son when you have some sense some situation in which you know you just want to go through, you just don't want to be seen, you just no mind, you think like that with those with with those words and go calm, you know. And of course, after when you see them, after you're outside, you're like, yes, we got it. But you know, in the moment, calm. And that, that it helps us. Amazing. And be, be flexible and be <laughs> ready to bend the rules. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and like, and like Bruce, like, like, like this. Uh, what is it? Be like water, says this kung fu guy. Great, thank you so much, guys. I'm gonna hand it over to Patricia to get questions from the audience, and then we'll be back. This has been wonderful, and we have many questions. Um, first, I wanted to ask you about the characters because um, not every day, you know, a filmmaker kind of like comes into this person's life and proposes to like film them for 
months or even years. So how did you manage to establish that relationship with them? And how did you manage to sort of become like a fly in the wall, you know, kind of like what Annabelle was talking about, just being very observant of what was happening, but at the same time following these people for hours. How did you manage to establish that? And I'm going to uh, sort of um, add something that one of our viewers asked, which is, how did the people of Congo get on board without the fear of repercussions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the, um, the relationship with them was, um, it, it happened naturally and step by step, step by step. Uh, it, there was a process of learning their culture. Uh, and I, I, at the first, at the first year, I wouldn't understand what they were saying, you know. So then uh, there was with us um, a, a guy, a young guy uh, that used to be a, a policeman and began with us from the very first day in which we were shooting this film all over the five years. And now he became a filmmaker in heart. That's what he would like to do. But he's a fisherman, agriculture, uh, uh, agriculture guy, etc. But what he really likes is to tell stories. And and he would at some point he would tell me, you know, why don't we put the camera here? Like, come here. And he would show me, and then <laughs> we would do. I would do that. So, and he's my. So he's our mate, and he was quite key to for us to you know to understand this world to to understand how things were uh, done we had to understand the codes and and uh, but i did many we did many mistakes um at the very beginning i was really mortified uh, uh, tormented because of the poverty of people and i remember we going one day to this family asking them if we could uh, adopt one of their kids that was near to us and so on. And uh, the mother, she told me, uh, she was first like, you know, like impressed with that and told me, no, I want each one, I, 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 I love each one of my kids and I don't want to separate from them. And, and she didn't say much more than that. And then I saw, I, I took me some days to understand and to feel that how arrogant from myself to think that I had something better, you know, to probably, yes, yeah, maybe, probably it would have been good if I would have adopted this girl that with the years actually did die. Um, but, you know, uh, to understand that there was not like somebody that had a truth and another one that not, but really, you know, just being one person to in front of each other, trying to understand each other was the lesson that I got from that moment. But I did many mistakes like that. And they, uh, so they trusted, these people trusted, you know, so look, I'm thinking in the second part of the, of the question these people and this community trusted us and we are doing our best to look after them and in that sense um, i mean there are many things for instance in the place this uh, village was taken by by paramilitaries um, and uh, this part of the story we didn't decided not to tell it precisely for looking after the people. So then there are things that were quite painful not to shoot, <laughs> you know, like this, which is a, like a sign, clear sign of the deterioration of, and the vulnerability of a, of a community that we did not shoot precisely to, to keep the people. Of course, it is worrying, you know, it is worrying how are going to be, how it's going to be for Tamara when it is shown in in the state that, that is called Zulia, in the, it's going to be shown in Maracaibo, which is the main city where the governor was. So there is a thought on how to do this uh, and how to get a balance and, uh, and keep her uh, the most safe from bullying possible because she's still in the party. 
Well, and we have a, a, another set of questions. This one is a little bit more technical. Um, so whoever wants to answer it, it's uh, how difficult was it to create the screenplay for this? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, let's just play. <laughs> Three hours. <laughs> we, we, could, we could talk it by heart in the end because we were rewriting it so many hundreds, hundreds of times that we literally could, like, at least the first page, we could all say by heart as far as, I mean, it was complex and it was a long, long, long process of, 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 of finding out more, rewriting, finding out more, rewriting, endless. Very difficult, but sí, that's, that's, that's what it an, is. It's an ongoing process that begins by setting up. I mean, we what there is this oscillation between observation, assimilation, seeing what are the things that resonate in oneself, and then writing. There is actual writing constant every night. Writing on, you know, there is a general concept and then there is always the, the the question of what is the core story and the reality confronts you with the changes of life and then one decides decides who am I sticking with and then you ask you to yourself for the hundredth time on what it, what is this story about and then on the other level and probably the most delicate is the human level because it's not only what you observe as a kind of sociologist, practically, on how you interpret this this universe, but there are the stories of what moves the people, you know, and how to treat that with delicacy and truthful to their to what they want to tell, and that at the same time how this serves to this vision that you have. So then it's you know, it's an ongoing process that. Uh, you know, we were actually there are no there are no many there is no much literature about script, how to work the script of a documentary. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a mystery. It's really a mystery. So then, in our case, we just did it, learning on the on the go, and of course with the principles of dramaturgy that one has. And with this dream of you know breaking the Aristotel Aristotelian structure, and at the end one falls right in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask you a few more questions because we don't have much time, unfortunately. We have about two more minutes for for questions and answers. So some people are wondering how Congo Mirador is doing now, and the other question is um, about Venezuela. Um, what would you say to young and passionate Venezuelans that want to become filmmakers and screenwriters? Well, uh, the Congo Mirador, well, this is going to be an honest and um, and and, and uh, this is going to be a spoiler. <laughs> but as it is, as this is not a, a thriller, so then it's not so much of a problem. Congo Mirador is on the verge of not existing no more. There are few, very, very few people left there, and uh, yeah, five people to be precise, and um, they still remain. So then, there is always hope. So let's well, see, let's, let's see, see what happens. Let's see what happens. But there is as well another way of existing, even if they are wherever they are. There is a sense of belonging to something. No? But and it's also some. It will be like probably the part of the myths of the future. No, I mean, I mean, there's a new. There's in Maracaibo. There's a barrio now called Nuevo Congo, which is New Congo, which is where many people went. And then maybe this film will be something like a like a book you read about the old times when you said, "Oh, this is where my grandmother lived." So we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Cam old Camarillo is still there. He said he's gonna die there. He's not going anywhere. Wow, so. really. It seems like you guys captured a moment in time that it's not going to repeat itself again. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah, why I recommend yeah. that people watch this film. <laughs> yes, yes, it's something that doesn't. And then a, a bit of the, the, the sense of, the, of this title is that you don't know if it existed or not. It's like, you know, mm. it's something that you saw, but you don't know if it was a dream or real. And to the young filmmakers, um, well, in Spanish we say this palante, and this palante right now is like is you know there are there are ways there are ways in our case uh, 
this film was possible because of the cooperation with with SEP in the artistic level, but as well with a whole team that you know that accessed to 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 an international world that is out there that is not easy. You know, uh, we have sent. Uh, 500 applications and we have got you know five uh, and one needs lots of uh, conviction mm. in what one is doing and uh, the humbleness to see that uh, to, to listen uh, to the others like there is a Venezuelan network, invisible network of filmmakers that we are there happy to read uh, the concepts and to to share knowledge overall in these times in which we are parties and in order to exist we cooperate you know that's the key i think and to be humble you know, enough to put your certainties and your concepts into constant revision revi revision 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 uh, in order to in order to improve them uh, mm. we are coming into a a world in which the narrative is very developed <laughs> and uh, well we we have many stories to tell this is what i think is our treasure our tragedy mm. is in a way our treasure because uh, it brings up in in humans the worst and the best at the same time so and it's a great opportunity to observe human nature i think and don't be uh, afraid don't be don't, afraid, no. Don't miedo. be afraid. You're not alone, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. In that note, I would like to call Gabriela again um, because I would like for her to make some closing remarks about the film. You know, she, as I introduced her, well, she's a, a very important person in the industry and, <laughs> you know, you are. <laughs> I don't know if that's important. I'm quite short. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, I was just going to thank you guys so much for participating and thank you, Patricia. Uh, this has been very educational, enlightening. The film is beautiful. Congratulations to you both for all the years you have spent making it. Um, it comes across your effort, your talent, your dedication to the process. So thank you so much. Uh, for those who haven't seen it, is there a, 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 a sort of, something you can tell them where to watch it or when it's going to be released or do you have a plan yet or you're working on it to see where people can see it and for those um academy members watching it then go to the academy screening room and exactly see it if you haven't yet we did the academy people can they know where to watch it and and the others uh, actually to finance this whole craziness now we have a crowdfunding campaign and you can go there if you go to our webpage once upon a time in venezuela.com you will you will find it and then you can you can actually watch it there if you for a little donation so to say it's called the secret screening <laughs> amazing amazing thank you so much thank you and thank you patricia thank you guys congratulations thank you, thank thank you, you so much thank Muchas you so gracias. much to our thank audience you. that was watching and asking interesting questions gracias. thank you gracias.